from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Fenella France, Chief of the Preservation Research and Testing Division. And on behalf of our division and Suvita, who's Chief of the Music Division, I'd like to welcome you all today for our Science Meets Music uh, Technical Studies of Musical Instruments Symposium. We've got a really exciting lineup, and so uh, I will introduce this and then let us flow into the talks without further ado. The Technical Studies of Historical Musical Instruments is not done extensively in the field and so it's fascinating and just delightful to have the speakers we have today brought together to actually share that information and some of the research they are doing. Uh, as part of an NEH, a National Endowment of the Humanities Preservation and Access Grant, the work that's been happening at the Library of Congress uh, along with our colleagues at George Washington and Catholic University is highlighting the uh, research of and the study of glass flutes by Claude Laurent from the library collection Date and C. Miller collection. And there's some really exciting research that you're going to hear about shortly. Collaborations are such an important part of our work, and we're delighted that within this research project, as I said, we're working not only with colleagues in the music division, but also both with George Washington University and the Catholic University of America Vitria State Laboratory. The NEH grant has allowed us to hire a two-year postdoc, and further collaborations with other, other local institutions have proved extremely rewarding as part of that. The Preservation Research and Testing Division has been working extensively to expand our suite of non-invasive instrumentation, as well as the application of various instruments to include the analysis of a wide range of heritage materials. And of course, collections such as music include materials such as glass, metal, wood, and a combination of organic, plant and animal materials, as well as inorganics. This research into understanding the degradation mechanisms of many materials necessitates this use of a lot of complementary analyses, and these have been a key part of what we've been working on in the lab ourselves, and we do really want to acknowledge uh, the techniques that we don't have in our lab and the expertise of our colleagues who are working with us. I'm going to go ahead and start by introducing all of the speakers at the beginning, um, and then we will flow through the three talks with the various speakers, and if everyone could hold their questions till the end of the three talks. So if you need to, scribble it down on your iPhone, but please, if everyone can turn your iPhones off, cell phones off. So our speakers of the first, uh, in the first presentation, which is the Collaborative Technical Study of Claude Laurent's Glass Flutes. Carolyn ward Bamford is a flautist and since 1993 has worked as music specialist and curator of musical instruments at the Library of Congress Music Division, where she oversees the library's holdings of approximately 2,000 musical instruments for study, performance and exhibit. She holds degrees in music, performance on the flute and archives management from Tufts University. Stephanie Lizard Zaleski is a postdoctoral scientist at George Washington University, where her research focuses on developing simple non-invasive analytical tools to study 19th century glass in historic collections. She obtained her PhD in chemistry from Northwestern University in 2016 and was recently a postdoctoral fellow with the Department of Scientific Research at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Isabella Muller is project manager at the Vitria State Laboratory at the Catholic University of America in charge of research and development programs for the US Department of Energy, glass formulations for Hanford site tank waste vitrification, long-term water leaching of various waste glasses, and development of predictive algorithms of the glass properties. She obtained a PhD in physical chemistry from Pierre-Marie Curie University in Paris and was a postdoctoral fellow in nuclear chemistry at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Lynn Brostoff holds a PhD in chemistry and a master's degree in polymer materials science and art history, and an advanced certificate in conservation of historic and artistic works with a specialty in paper conservation. For the last 25 years, Lynn has worked as a conservation scientist in leading museums and libraries, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and the National Gallery of Art, Smithsonian Museum Conservation Institute, and most recently, the Library of Congress. 
Jamie Curlin, who's uh, at the second presentation, is a musicologist and independent researcher based in Northern Virginia. She's currently working on a project with the Music Instrument Collection at the Library of Congress, previously was a Curatorial Research Fellow in Musical Instruments at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and a Curatorial Assistant at the Musical Instrument Museum in Phoenix. And Jean-Philippe Achard is the curator of Bowed String Instruments at the French National Collection at the Musée de la Musique in Paris. He studied musical acoustics at the Conservateur National Superior de Musique in Paris, please excuse my pronunciation, and was a research fellow at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and at the Laborte de Research et la Restauration of the Musée de la Musique, uh, developing methodologies for the observation and the analysis of materials of musical instruments. And his PhD research was on the materials and techniques used to varnish musical instruments the 15th to 18th century. The three titles of the talk, as I said, the first talk uh, by the first four speakers, Collaborative Technical Studies of Claude Laurent's Glass Flutes, the Oele of Murol, Preserving and Interpreting an Ancient Musical Treasure by Jamie Kerland, and Recent Research on Stradivari Instruments at the Musée de la Musique in Paris, Jean-Philippe Bichard. As I said, we will hold all the questions uh, till the end of that. And I will now, with much pleasure, hand over to our first presenters. Good afternoon. Welcome to Science Meets Music. As Fenella introduced, I'm Carolyn Ward-Bamford from the Music Division at the Library of Congress, and I'm delighted to be a part of the team um, studying and presenting today's collaborative technical study of Claude Laurent's glass flutes. I'm incredibly grateful to the Library of Congress and its Preservation Directorate, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and my fellow collaborators at George Washington and Catholic Universities. And without a doubt, my deepest, my deepest thanks goes to the donor of the flute collection, Dayton C. Miller whose inquisitiveness intersected with his professions in music and science, and whose flute collection continues to inspire. So, a little background. A few years ago, on what seemed a normal day for me at work in the flute vault, I pulled open a drawer, a storage drawer, to look at some of the 18 crystal flutes that we have. And I realized they weren't all crystal clear. Some appeared foggy. I quickly shut the drawer and thought, was I storing them incorrectly? What was it in the glass that was causing this? How long has this been going on? I peeked in and again I wondered, um, what was I going to do about this? Fortunately, I had met Fenella, a scientist and a flutist. And soon thereafter, Lynn Brostoff and I began working on our um, historical and technical study of the Laurent glass flutes. This involved a new assessment of the flutes, an understanding of the flute maker Claude Laurent, his manufacturing methods, the causes of the fogginess, how to arrest the causes, and how to stabilize the flutes. In 1806, Claude Laurent of Paris invented and patented a flute en cristal, in crystal, or of crystal, a material he claimed was more stable than wood and ivory, which were currently popular in flute manufacture. He made the flutes between 1805 in a variety of materials, keywork, and colors. The location of his gallery is depicted here in the Palais Royal, which was bustling with other craftsmen, including his silversmith, one of them, uh, Jean Dupin. The flutes were extremely popular and sent to quite a few world leaders, um, including the one we hold here in the Miller Collection, which, which was sent to President Madison on the occasion of his second term. Prior to our research, and despite the appeal of the Laurent flutes, little was known or understood about the glass flutes, or their maker, or his workshop. We uncovered his town of birth his baptismal date and his death date. We also created a website and database of approximately 185 flutes known or manufactured, um, building upon Dayton C. Miller's original list of 40 
And through technical analysis, we also uncovered the composition of the glass, but more on that later. And now, meet the collector, Dayton C. Miller, where scientist meets musical instrument. Miller was a flute fanatic, a flutist, a flute composer, a flute maker, a flute researcher, a flute collector, and a scientist at Case Western for over four decades. His careers in acoustics and physics led him to experiment with the acoustics of sound. And here is depicted in the middle um, the invention of the phonodique. He invented this, with which he studied the overtones um, produced by flutes of various materials. Also shown here is a picture from one of his ledgers with detailed observations that he took on all of his flutes, including the glass flutes, along with his huge archive of flute-related correspondence, books, and photographs, which he donated to the library in 1941, and his 1925 publication on the flutes of glass, and that started us on our journey that continues today. And now I will turn the story of the journey over to Stephanie. All right, no problem. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Let's see. Okay, I assume everyone can hear me okay? Good. All right. So in the spirit of Dr. Miller, who I will also want to add was one of the first American scientists to experiment with x-rays, um, which is really interesting, we undertook this study, a uh, technical study of the Laurent flutes. Um, and here on the slide, I have an example of one of the ones in the collection. And as you can see, there's a, this fogginess that Carolyn talks about, but it also varies in joints. So it's something that we need to take into account when we're actually doing the analysis. So undertaking this, we had the goals of understanding how these were made. Again, like Carolyn said, these weren't really studied before, so that's one of the things that we on set to do. We also wanted to know what these flutes were made out of uh, since they were supposedly on crystal. Uh, we also are assessing the condition using microscopic examination. And this all contributes to determining what the causes of glass deterioration are, as well as different types of risk factors that we can experience. And we were fortunate to have an NEH grant from the Preservation and Access Division um, to create a simple analytical toolkit uh, that can help us assess glass type and condition. And so pertaining to our question of how these flutes were actually made, I hope that the animation that I have on here is actually working. Uh, we brought two flutes that were made in 1819 and 1828 to the radiology department at the George Washington University Hospital. And what's really amazing about this technique is that here you see 0.6 millimeter slices, axial slices, and the data taken for these two flutes was actually done under two minutes. And so what I show here is I have a, a program that I developed where it detects circles. So you have an inner diameter and an outer diameter. And the plot below the animations, again, that are just scrolling through the head joint, so it's really amazing is you can actually see the tone holes, you can see the ridges. Uh, but what's amazing here is despite the fact that these were made almost a decade apart, that the inner cal calculated inner diameter is about 17.9 millimeters. And if we move on to the upper body joint, uh, you can see that there is a very regular stepwise decrease in the inner diameter of the joint. And the interference that you see in the 1819 is actually because the metal fittings and keys on the flutes actually produce slight interference in the uh, CT scan. Regardless, you start off at around 17 and a half millimeter inner diameter, working way down to about 14 and a half in exactly half millimeter steps. So this tells us that these flute makers knew exactly what type of sound they were trying to produce, and they had a method for actually fabricating these instruments. And just again, to really drive that point home, with the lower body joint, we see a same, same exact trend, where the measured inner diameter of these starts at around 14 millimeters, and in half millimeter steps, goes down to about a little 11 and a half. 
So it's really amazing because what we can now do is use this information to reconstruct the idea about the tone and the sound of these instruments. And we're also looking at hopefully scanning earlier flutes as well as later flutes to see if there was a change in the manufacturing process. So of course, not only are we interested in understanding how they were made, but what they were made out of. And here I show the two major techniques that we use to determine composition of the Laurent flutes. We can use UV light, and I'll show these are just two head joints under visible light, but if we use a UV light source, different uh, metallic species in the glass will fluoresce certain colors. Um, and with non-invasive X-ray fluorescence, we can actually get an elemental fingerprint without actually having to take a sample. And so under UV light, you can see that these head joints are very clearly different. And so 611 has this characteristic green-yellow color, which is indicative of manganese used in the glass, which was actually used as a decolorizing agent due to the iron in some of the raw materials for the glass. And the pink color of 378, which is actually the head joint of the what we call the James Madison flute, is indicative of there being a leaded or crystal formulation in the glass. And you can see that the labeled elements that we have in the X-ray fluorescence spectra very well, agree very well with what we find with our eyes using the UV analysis. And so analytical techniques, especially these simple ones that we are trying to develop, can help us understand how composition actually relates to observed deterioration. So in the Dayton C. Miller collection, this fogginess that Carolyn talked about is actually an endemic symptom of advanced glass deterioration. And in this very extreme case for 717, you can actually very visibly see it with your eye. You can see some cracking, you can see spalling, which is actually a loss of the uppermost reacted glass layer. But here I just want to outline some of the techniques that we're exploring to actually really get a quantitative understanding of the observed glass deterioration. So we can use a technique called FORS, which is fiber optic reflectance spectroscopy, is a molecular fingerprinting technique. And here we're interested in peaks that are associated with water and hydroxide, which is actually a marker of glass deterioration of the silicate SiOH network. We can also use surface pH because with the formation of hydroxide, you will have an increase in pH, so a more alkaline environment on the surface. Um, and that just shows with increasing pH, we know that there's more progressive deterioration. And lastly, um, in you know, using the expertise of GW, we're doing image analysis, where we're actually trying to give a quantitative measure to texture rather than just using a qualitative assessment by eye. Um, and so different degrees of cracking or different types of features will actually give you a different quantitative measure of texture. And actually, we found that we can use the non-invasive XRF to give us an understanding about if there is a reacted, deteriorated surface layer. So here I show a chip taken from one of the joints of 717, which Isabel will elaborate on in the next section, but you can see that there's a darker layer on the surface of this in cross section. And this is actually an alkaline depleted surface layer. And if you look at the potassium composition of the bulk versus the surface, that the XRF measurements actually very closely match that to what we calculate with the surface. And this is because the non-invasive XRF is actually very surface sensitive. For light elements such as potassium, the depth of the sample that you're actually looking at is on the order of about 20 microns. So because this is surface sensitive, we can actually use this as a factor of determining deterioration in these potash glasses. And so now that we have all this data, we actually need to do something with it. So here I show sample data for Flute 717 in the Dayton C. Miller collection. As you can see, for each joint, so it goes from head joint to foot joint and the extra joint, we have all these different variables, such as the surface pH, the glass composition, which includes the percent surface potassium is what we're calling it, and then other things such as calcium, manganese, iron, lead, and rubidium, 
as well as the intensity of one of the peaks that I show in the uh, fiber optic reflectance spectra. And we're also working to incorporate the quantitative texture measures right now. So we can take this data and we can actually perform different types of statistical analysis in order to pull out trends. So here we're testing out a technique called principal component analysis, which sounds very fancy and complicated, but essentially what it's doing is telling us what kind of variance there is in our data. So we can input as many variables as we'd like, but just for this example, I show flute joint, the surface pH, the surface potassium, and the calcium that are calculated by XRF. So essentially having the flute joint forces each kind of cluster, linear cluster, to be per joint. And so the plot that I have here of the first three principal components describes about 90% of the variance and variability in the numbers that we see in this database. And so we see by these blue lines, which are actually vectors, which tell us about how each variable contributes to the variance that we observe, um, that they're actually going in opposite directions. So this actually implies that the pH and the surface, the calculated surface potassium are inversely related. So if we actually go down for each linear joint cluster and do a relative ranking, we can see that there's a decrease in a pH and increase in potassium which we're now working on actually seeing if how the ranking compares to previous qualitative assessments by a conservator. In addition, this is a separate technique, but what we're doing is can we actually predict the condition of these flutes by using a, a cluster analysis? So again, here we have a, a relative ranking now based on our more quantitative understanding of the data, such as the surface pH, the potassium and the degree of microcracking that we see on the surface, and we can give it a, essentially what's a score in this case. Um, and you can see that the red points, which are what we consider to be unstable glasses, do cluster out fairly well from the at-risk or stable glasses. And we see, you know, again, what I showed in the previous slide is that unstable glasses have low surface potassium and typically more alkaline pH and running this through a classification predictive, creating a model, so far we've been able to obtain about 80% accuracy from this. So this is a really promising way of you know, creating a database of what we know to be deteriorated or not, and being able to share this information with other folks that have these types of instruments is really valuable for preserving these collections. And we're hoping that the model studies that Isabel is now going to talk about will further inform our assignments of these rankings and really have a physical understanding of what's going on with the deterioration in these flutes. So the fun started for us at the uh, Vitro State Lab of the Catholic University in the fall of 2014 when uh, you see on this uh, image, on this photo, my colleague, Dr. Buckley, sitting at the microscope and taking a little sample of 500 micron, that's a huge piece of this flute, um, two little chips. Uh, and we actually included in the fun a, a high school student who worked with us all year long during her senior year as a high school student in Montgomery County. And that was um, uh, really exciting for her as well. So this is flute uh, 717, the one that Stephanie showed you earlier, and you can see where we sampled. This is taken at the very bottom of the V groove, decorative uh, grooves that are, you have seen in the larger photo of the flute before. We were also able to sample from another flute which was not showing any sign of damage. Um, in terms of a chemical alteration, but uh, there was a extra fluid joints that we could sample. You can see here a scoring that helped us take this whole piece. So with this uh, huge piece of over 50 milligram of 1235, we were able to take multiple corroborative analytical uh, measurements, as well as scanning electron microscope 
um, analysis. But with the duplicate analysis, we were making sure we were not missing any element in the composition of those fluid. And then, of course, we had those two little chips of 717 for scanning electron microscope as well. What we learned then with those tiny chips is that these glass are simply potassium silicate with a few percent of calcium and a little bit of sodium, absolutely no lead. This is not surprising because in the 1800 to 1850s, there was a glass that was extremely popular because it was a very brilliant and very hard and very easy to do nice decorative engraving and that was known as bohemian crystal. Not what we call crystal today, which is leaded. We also were able to do a nice polishing. So this is a uh, back and bat scattered image um, of the uh, two little uh, chips of 717. You are looking here at the top part of the sample. So this section is what the exterior of the fluid so, and then this is the interior of the fluid. And here in this uh, very nicely magnified image, you can see clearly that the surface, the upper surface of the fluid has about 30 micron of uh, a layer that is of a different composition. And this is what happened if you look at the chemical composition of each of those spots we analyzed. Coming from the outside with two and a half micron spots, we can see that the potassium is very much depleted, around five atomic percent by weight here, and it rises to about 16 in the core of the fluid with a sharp rise. Same depletion with the sodium. So both of those alkali depleted in the surface as a result of the al uh, so-called leaching of the glass or reaction with the humidity. Well, this uh, is a well-known phenomenon which we call the interdiffusion. So here I have a little cartoon of a glass structure which is the silicon and the oxygen in red. Those oxygen that link the silicon to each other are what we call the bridging oxygen. And then some of those oxygen are uh, remaining open so that they provide charge balance to what we call the glass modifiers, the sodium, the potassium, or the calcium. And what's happening is uh, the water makes available a proton that is going to sit in place of this alkali, causing it to diffuse outside with the equations I've marked here. And you can see that as a result of that, you will have a slightly increased pH at the surface. And that's what we see. And what do I do next? This. So now that we understand what's happening in the fluid, we want to try to replicate it in the lab so that we can play games. Because unfortunately, Carolyn is not giving us the fluid to play with more than the 500 micron. So of those two fluids that we have here analyzed in the first two columns, we made three replicas. I say replica because they really include all of the minor components, the 717, high in potassium, the 1235, and, the, and another fluid that is a highly uh, eyeleaded glass. But we also bridge the gap between 717 and 1235 with steps of um, half percent potassium. And this is a table of all the composition we measured to verify that we actually made the glass we wanted to make. This is how we made it. This is Rui, our intern, making the glass. All of the ingredients are put in a platinum crucible at 1450 Celsius uh, for up to four hours of melt. And then the crucible is uh, quenched into cold water to avoid any crystallization of the glass melt. And this very fast cooling uh, induces stress in the glass that will cause it to spontaneously break in small tiny pieces here. So we take those tiny pieces and we put them back into a thin crucible so we could create a thin slice. And it looks like a coin of about three millimeter thick, which we have very carefully annealed so that we could cut small coupons that we will be using in the lab. And this is the result of our 
um, little games in the lab. So what you are looking here are a scanning electron microscope of each of those little coupons here is now mounted in cross section and then we'll polish it until we expose the surface and we can see what has been happening to the glass in cross section. So the black part of each image here is where the exposure to the air and the humidity uh, takes place. Um, it's actually mounted in epoxy, so it gives a black um, image in um, here. We have two techniques of accelerating the response to uh, water aggression or leaching, the environmental chamber or the vapor hydration test. We started with the vapor hydration test because we wanted to see in a very aggressive environment. But when you speak of aggressive, this is a test that was designed about two decades ago for testing the glass formulation that's designed for the nuclear waste glass. And that's supposed to demonstrate the glass will be good for a scale of a million years. So what happened is the test is normally conducted at 200 Celsius and 100% relative humidity. And in just a matter of a few days, the, this kind of glass was gone. So we decreased a little bit the relative humidity. Still, we have a results in one or, or five days that shows a very complicated structure of the alteration layer, very different from what we see in the fluid, fortunately, and hundreds of microns of alteration. So on the other hand, the environmental chamber, 90 Celsius, 90% relative humidity, gives us a much nicer view that does compare to what we have seen in 717. In one day in the environmental chamber, we see three micron of reacted layer. In seven days, 65 micron. And we can also do an analytical profile here of the spots of the electron uh, dispersive spectroscopy which I have plotted here against the 717 I've uh, shown you earlier. So this is the real flute here, which after 200 years is about 30 micron altered. This is our lab replication in one day or three days. Seven days, unfortunately, is going way up there, 63 microns. So now we will concentrate on environmental chamber coupon prepared between three and five days so that we could replicate what we have observed on the flute. We have some excellent linear fit of the result. The response of um, how much of the depths of alteration with as a function of time are all very linear. And uh, we can see that as you move from the low potassium content to the higher potassium content, the kinetics increase. Well, that increase is actually a response of, so this is my low potassium from one to seven days, and this is my high potassium. With only 4% increase in potassium, you have actually a response that's a quadratic response of potassium, so a square of how much you increase the potassium, which is very important. Unfortunately, the VHT test was too complicated. We were not able to really uh, use those results to simulate the flute. It showed us that there is some effect of saturation. However, what was very useful is we could see that the leaded glass was a much slower um, type of reaction. So now we can concentrate on that same leaded glass in the environmental chamber. So these are our findings do, doing uh, all of this test in the lab. And now I can let um, my colleague Green tell you the rest. Thank you, Isabel. So uh, as Isabel mentioned, um, the VHT tests were very aggressive. And when we looked, uh, we wanted to kind of step back and see how, uh, how does this experimental work in the lab compare to what we're really seeing on the flutes. 
And so what I show here um, are some images we took uh, under the microscope of two of the flutes, and then images just of the coupons, not in cross-section, obviously. And those images on your right are samples that were aged artificially in the environmental chamber. And we were actually quite excited jumping up and down when we saw that the cracking patterns look so similar. So this really supports exactly what uh, Isabel was saying about that these model studies appear to be uh, good replicates of what we're seeing uh, naturally. And I point out that uh, there's a difference between one day and seven days aging in terms of the actual cracking pattern uh, going from kind of very fine uh, cracking to then what looks like a much denser network of cracking and also separation between the cracks. So this looks consistent with what we're seeing on the flutes in terms of what we might term an earlier stage of deterioration versus a more advanced stage. And you may be thinking in your head, oh, yes, that's crizzling. Um, well, it's a very common term used in the conservation field to describe glass deterioration. And we've looked at quite a lot of flutes with many people. And we found that everybody had a different idea about what crizzling really means. So we're just throwing it out. <laughs> and we're going to try and use more descriptive language. So uh, yeah, again, stepping back and what we actually see on the flutes, um, as I said, uh, this very light cracking does appear to be uh, consistent with what we could term an early stage of deterioration. However, um, we, as I said, we've looked at quite a lot of flutes, and it's actually very hard to make these condition assessments with your eyes, even under the microscope. And so if you use the right light and you look very carefully, you can often find, as you can see on the far right, I hope, uh, some very fine cracking in the exterior. But it's very complicated with these objects, which have different finishes on the surface. And so sometimes you have a very high degree of polish and a very nice surface. And on the far left, we show a high leaded flute, and we believe that's a pristine surface. But in the middle, uh, that's actually a rough polished surface. And you look, and you look, is that deteriorated? Well, you know, not so easy to tell. And if it's just a question of hydration, and Stephanie showed how we can actually detect hydrated water in the glass, you're never going to see it with your eye. So this early stage is quite difficult to assess. When you get to severe cracking, however, you can definitely see it, especially under the microscope. But when you can see it, and when they're foggy, unfortunately, that means that the deterioration is very advanced, and it's very difficult to intervene at that point to preserve your objects. Um, and I show here three images of flutes that we, um, we took under the microscope, and this is our friend 717, which that is obviously the uh, flute in very bad condition that we focused on a lot in our studies. So we, um, beyond uh, just earlier or later types of degradation, we also noted um, some other conditions. And one is uh, looking for crystalline deposits, which in the literature have been said to be an early sign of deterioration. So therefore, we were really kind of looking for them. Uh, and we did find all kinds of material uh, on the interior of the flutes. And we did take samples uh, often. And we did Raman spectroscopy on those samples. And on your left, you can see an image uh, with some different material. It looks crystalline. Uh, we took some samples. And unfortunately, all of those samples that we've taken and looked at with Raman spectroscopy have turned out to be what I would call polishing debris. We found iron oxides, which are likely from jeweler's rouge. And we also found calcium carbonate, which very well also could be used as polishing agent. However, our samples that we aged in the environmental chamber are of very good use here. And on the right, we have a very high magnified image uh, looking r right in a crack of a, a, a quite deteriorated uh, model sample. This is our replica glass. Um, 
and there does appear to be material inside the cracks. And Stephanie was able to get a very beautiful Raman spectrum of that material. And in fact, it has a very good identification with a potassium bicarbonate. In that case, we can say, yes, there is a deterioration product. And maybe that is something that we can even find or expect could happen. And uh, we also had x-ray diffraction done of these coupons. And what I've circled there are peaks. So as you should know or do know, glass is a completely amorphous material. So normally, if you did x-ray diffraction, you would just have that big, lumpy peak there. But there are some very sharp peaks. And that is indicating that there is some crystalline material. And as the uh, percent potassium uh, increased in the samples. You see more of it. And this is something that is happening with artificial aging and not something to expect in an early stage of deterioration in these glasses. So we, uh, sin although we have not seen it yet, it is something that we possibly could find in very deteriorated materials. There, are, uh, there is another condition that's a very important condition. And we know from um, uh, what's known about glass leaching and from our model samples that we could expect to develop an alkaline surface uh, on the flutes themselves. And on occasion, we have seen flutes that do have visible liquid alkaline drops. And this is often called weeping. Uh, again, we're trying to get away from these kind of jargony terms since not everybody uses them consistently. Um, we only, out of our 19 flutes, have only seen one flute and only one of its joints that has this condition. Um, and I think you can see it pretty well in the, uh, in the images that I show there is these teeny tiny little like dew-like droplets. Uh, and we also on that same flute see what appears to be a kind of pitting, which could have occurred from the droplets drying after they had acted corrosively on the surface. But that can also happen from water and cleaning. So we suspect, and this did not happen on our model samples, and we suspect this could be another mechanism that involves the hydration of the glass and then a sudden change in humidity that can cause this uh, phenomenon to occur. And we're doing some new experiments to verify that now. And so if we put these observations together with our mo the observations on the model glass, uh, we actually see that the model studies are supporting what we see quite well. Um, and just comparing them kind of side by side, uh, it's very important that we have the model studies support the observation that the high leaded glass flutes are quite stable compared to the potash glass flutes, because we only had two here to look at. So it would have been very difficult to make that conclusion. Uh, but now that we have the model studies, I think we can say that pretty safely. Uh, we also saw right off the bat that we had a very high incidence of deterioration among the potash glass flutes. And the model studies are predicting that the actual amount of potassium in the base glass is itself a predictor of the inherent instability in the glass itself. And that is quite important. We have seen little or no crystalline deposits on the flutes themselves, which is not what is predicted in the literature. And what the model studies are telling us is that that is something that we should associate with very late stage deterioration and may or may not occur eventually in these objects. And um, as I just said, uh, we can have this other phenomenon of liquid alkaline drops. And we have taken pH measurements of the drops themselves. And they're like 10. So they are extremely corrosive. Um, and all of these, this work together really helps us to understand what's going on in the flutes and really does justify all the trouble and expense that we go to uh, and have gone to at the library uh, to design new storage for the flutes. And that is because the environmental factor is very important and can't be ignored. We're doing artificial aging, and we do think that it is reflecting what goes on in the flutes very well. However, that was at steady conditions, 
and very controlled conditions. And of course, these flutes have had a life with different owners in different museums and been exhibited a lot or not, or been in a drawer. And they've been exposed to different conditions. And that probably is the deciding factor of the condition that they're in, given that they have inherent instability. And we would like to point out, again, with our, our flute 475, which Stephanie showed before, that in the four joints, we can actually see different conditions. And you can see that in this beautiful photograph by the, the fogginess in the head joint, which is on top. And then on the third one, which would have been an extra joint that was made for a change in pitch that was probably put away, OK, we're theorizing, but it's in the pristine condition. And these four joints were made with roughly the same formulation. Um, and so it's really a beautiful example of how the environment can affect the condition, including the player's breath. And so we have often seen the head joints to be in worse condition. And we think that is because of the increased exposure to uh, moisture from the breath of the, of the flutist. So in summary, um, we do want to point out for anyone who has a flute and looks at it um, themselves that it can be very difficult to assess the condition just with the eye. And we've come up with some tools, and many of them are very simple, and we're very proud of that, uh, that can be used to supplement what you see with your eye that can really help assess whether you have an unstable material and what condition it's in. And of course, we feel very strongly that the inter interdisciplinary aspect of our research has added tremendous value to what we understand about these flutes, including to what we understand about Laurent himself, who was not just an innovator and a craftsman, but definitely a businessman, because the bottom line was probably the cost of making that flute. <laughs> and we believe that's probably why he made the potash glass substitutes. And I just did want to conclude one, one more uh, second here about uh, the fact that, you know, we've been doing this for four years, this research. And, you know, I really, I sat down and I said to Carolyn, what have we learned? And I was so happy to hear that as a curator, Carolyn feels that she has gained so much in terms of learning how to ask questions and to better think about the material properties of an individual object when she uh, is the caretaker. Um, and of course, never to assume, because as we all know, these flutes are still listed in most catalogs as crystal flutes. So we now know that the, the actual story is quite different. But the scientists, I think we all have learned different things as well and not just how rewarding it is to participate in the care of historical objects, um, but the importance of expanding our, our understanding of something that you know a lot of people would say, oh, we know how glass deteriorates. That's all completely done already. What are you spending your time on that for? But every type of object is different, and I think we've learned a lot about how these may be deteriorating in a slightly different way, and um, that we should also not assume. So thank you. That's it. And without further ado, our second speaker, Jamie Kelly. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here, and I'd like to thank the Library of Congress for the invitation. I also must thank my co-authors, who I wish were here because they did much of the scientific research on these objects, but um, I hope to be able to share their, their work with you. My name is Jamie Curland, and I worked at the MFA as a curatorial research fellow in musical instruments for the last four years. When I began working with the collection, my first project was working on a project related to the alloy of Meroe. I am happy to share the progress my colleagues and I have done on this project. When we set, on the, set out on this journey, we did not know what to expect. We had learned, hoped to learn more about these instruments and hopefully create replicas, but we have learned so much more. An aulos, or the plural alloy, were the principal wind instruments from antiquity. Also known to the Romans as tibia or tibiae, 
The instruments have double reeds like modern oboes and were played in tuned pairs with one pi pipe primarily playing a melodic line while the other would play the drone. Unlike a modern wind instrument that uses both hands on one pipe, aulos players or aulites can only use one hand per instrument limiting their melodic options. Early aulos finds are made of wood or bone, often with metal reinforcement over the joints, but construction evolved over time. By the Hellenistic and Roman imperial periods, mechanically sophisticated systems were made of various metals, bone, and wood. We see here the various mechanisms that we have seen on the MFA's alloy. The fragments have either a bone or wood core, with two fitted bronze sleeves surrounding the core. The bronze sleeves measure about 0.3 millimeters thick, or less. The top of the instrument features, features a bone bulb, which served as the reed insert, and the flared bell would be located at the end of the instrument. There are various types of advanced mechanisms, including sliders, rotating cuffs, and chimneys. Unlike modern woodwind keys that move up and down, these sliders would slide over the tone hole, allowing a larger pitch range given the limited size of the player's hand. The sliders could reach notes out of reach. The rotating cuffs could open or close a given tone hole, allowing for minor changes in modality or key. Here, we see some of the fragments in further detail. On the top left, we see a cross section of one fragment, which clearly shows the bone core tinted bluish green by the corroded metal with two sl thin sleeves of bronze. Next to it, we see a beautifully cast dolphin holding a scallop shell in its mouth. This was on top of a sliding mechanism. Now that we've seen the basic mechanisms and anatomy of these instruments, I would like to take a minute to contextualize them within Greek mythology. When I began working on this project, one of my first tasks was surveying the MFA's collection of ancient art, searching for depictions of alloy. I was thrilled to find that the MFA holds over 100 examples of iconography featuring the instruments. They are also in various media, including Etruscan painting, Greek sculpture, carvings on coins, and etchings on gemstones, and of course, ancient Greek pottery. This red figure ceramic bell crater dating to about from 370 to 360 BC portrays the origin story of the alloy. The goddess Athena, who is said to have created the alloy, is seen playing the instrument under an olive tree. While entertaining the Olympian gods, she becomes embarrassed when she discovers how distorted her face appears when blowing the reeds of the alloy, and thus casts the instruments aside. Marcius, a Phrygian satyr shown at the far right, finds a discarded alloy, claims them as his own invention, and becomes famous for his beautiful playing. Apollo, depicted to the right of the tree, is challenged by Marcius to a godly battle of the bands. The terms of the competition dictate that the winner would choose the punishment for the loser. Both play their instruments with great skill, Marcius on the alloy and Apollo on his stringed lyre. Apollo challenges Marcius to play his instrument upside down. While this was done easily on the lyre, Marcius was unable to play his alloy in this fashion. Sur serving as judges, the muses awarded the contest to Apollo. As punishment, Apollo had Marcius hanged from a tree and flayed. The pipes of his alloy were reportedly joined to his eviscerated body to create the first bagpipe. Alloy are well documented in Greek mythology, iconogra iconography, and even texts including the Bible. Played by both men and women, they were used for celebrations such as Dionysian festivals, but also for funerary rites, which may explain why the MFA's alloy were discovered at a burial site. The instruments were often played alone, meaning one player playing the two instruments, not one pipe at the same time. Um, but were also used to accompany singing and dancing. The numerous artworks showing alloy performers not only illuminate various classical myths, but also provide useful information regarding how the instruments were played and what their role was in the ancient world. Due to the physical challenges of playing two instruments at once, a forbia or halter um, or mouth strap was used as seen as this in, 
as seen in this image, to help the player keep the two instruments in his or her mouth, but also helping support the player's embouchure. While we know these instruments were double reeds due to reed, um, but due to the reeds' organic materials, we have very few remains of them, which were, which were most likely made by, of Arundo dunax, a common species of cane. Scholars have been using these native materials to ascertain how reeds were made, and thankfully there are some iconographic examples to show roughly this, the, the shape and size, although they aren't completely accurate in many cases. At the top, the photo is of reeds um, made by scholars at a, um, a workshop I went to in Italy um, where we tried to make these reeds out of the traditional materials, but also trying to figure out how they were made historically. As I mentioned before, early aloes finds are made of bone or wood, and they didn't necessarily have many mechanisms, if any. But by the Hellenistic and Rom Roman imperial periods, mechanically sophisticated systems were made of various metals, bone, and wood. We see here some extant examples of the latter, the more technologically advanced instruments. To understand our fragments, let's go back to when they were found. In 1921, a Harvard University Museum of Fine Arts expedition, led by George Andrew Reisner, the MFA's curator of Egyptian art, and a Harvard professor of Egyptology excavated the burial site of the Nubian queen Amani Shaketo of Meroe in what is now Sudan. Amani Shaketo, who reigned between 10 and 1 BC, was a powerful ruler, and after a period of conflict between Meroe and the Roman Empire, she signed a treaty with the Emperor Augustus that set the stage for a new era of trade and communication between the two powers. Her kingdom Kingdom of Meroe was a metropolitan center for trade along the Nile River Valley and near the Red Sea, which saw cultural exchange with people from the Mediterranean and Western and Central Asia. Other artifacts found in the area show an advanced level of metropolitan quality and sophistication. Here we see a drawing from the early 19th century of Queen Amani Shaketo's pyramid, and at this point, it was very well preserved, only with the top part just a little um, damaged. This burial site outside the city of Meroe had already been discovered by physician and explorer Giuseppe Ferlini in the 1830s. While investigating the pyramid, he came upon a treasure trove of gold. Unfortunately, during his exploration, he and his team raided and destroyed many structures on the site and took dozens of pieces of gold and silver jewelry. Fortunately for us, a few objects remained. Here's another photo of the burial site after Ferlini had visited it. So, in 1921, on his expedition, George Reisner and his team unearthed the entrance to Amani Shaketo's burial chamber at the entrance of her tomb and found a large cache of ancient alloy buried in the dirt, at least 12 instruments, thus six pairs. Thankfully, Reisner was one of the first to take in-situ photography during excavations, and we have a photo of these instruments before they were excavated. Unfortunately, they, had, they seemed to be, have been excavated bit by bit instead of in a whole block. Thus, by the time the excavation was finished, the, most of the pipes were in fragments. But this grouping of instruments is one of the largest caches ever excavated. These fragments which we see here were kept in the original excavation boxes until our project began in 2013. We also know of other alloy found nearby in the city of Meroe, although they, um, the example on um, one side is um, an as assemblage of fragments that were at the University of Liverpool Museum, although we have not been able to find them. And on the other side, we have a statue of an owlet or an alloy player found in Meroe as well. After the instruments were excavated, they were shipped to the MFA in 12 original excavation boxes with fragments of various sizes and shapes and various stages of degradation. Some boxes were lined with muslin, and many of these had original field notes in Arabic from the excavators. 
Over the years, a few scholars came to study these fragments. In 1946, Nicholas Bodley, known to many as Nicholas Bessaraboff, wrote a very pre preliminary report on the fragments. And in the early 90s, English researcher Morris Byrne came to study the instruments, having examined many other alloy and collections worldwide. In 2012, Olga Sukowska came and examined the fragments and urged us to consider an in-depth project focused on them. So in 2013, after receiving generous support from museum donors, the Musical Instrument Department, the Department of Art in the Ancient World, and the Museum's Conservation Department joined together to focus our efforts on the alloy of Meroe. Suzanne Gonsica, our conservator, triaged the objects and decided that we must first rehouse the instruments and take high resolution photography. So she created custom archival acid free boxes and rehoused the fragments. Although the MFA's fragments had languished in their boxes for almost a century, we were actually quite lucky that earlier irreversible attempts had not been made to conserve them. Like several, several like instruments and other collections were put together long ago with irreversible waxes and resins. Our fragments, although severely corroded, were untouched. So when Suzanne was able to see the fragments on a clean surface in the new boxes, she began to see fragments that were begging to be joined together and used a reversible adhesive solution to adhere the pieces. She then took the fragments to the MFA's conservation scientists to perform various tests. We see here x-ray images of several of the fragments. One outstanding mystery was knowing how the cylindrical bronze sleeves were fabricated, and the x-ray shows that there were no solder seams. We think that the seamless tubes were cast from tin bronze and then likely further hammered, possibly around a metal core. Final turning and smoothing of the surface with a lathe-like instrument facilitated the perfect fitting of the extremely thin straight tubes, as we see distinctive parallel markings on the metal surface that have not been mineralized by corrosion. There were also several pieces with mysterious but seemingly purposeful cuts in the metal, as we see on the bottom part of the slide. As we saw briefly earlier, this specific scan showed us that there were rotating sleeves adorned with knobs that gave allowed a given tone hole to be opened or closed. So they would be turned, you can't really see it, but the sleeve would turn over the, the, the tone hole. Some of the fragments had wood cores instead of bone. The British Museum's Carolyn Cartwright, an ancient wood specialist, was able to identify our sample as Olea europea, European olive tree wood. And the radiocarbon date is between 52 BC and 54 AD. Metallography showed redeposited copper in some of the tubes. And a brown sleeve on the bone bulb piece at right was actually corroded silver. Conservation scientists Michelle Derrick and Richard Newman from the MFA conducted scanning electron microscopy and energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence, which gave us a much, much better data on the chemical composition of the various metals used in the fragments. Thanks to quantitative elemental analysis on the cross sections of the tubing, we learned that the tubes were made of tin bronze with about 90% copper and 10% tin. We also took some fragments to Massachusetts General Hospital to be CT scanned, although the, due to the high concentration of metal, we did not see much in the resulting images. Scanning electron microscopy imaging also showed fibrous materials in one of the holes of the knobs of, a sleeve of one of the rotating sleeve mechanisms. MFA textile conservator Joel Thompson identified this as flax fiber. Now as to the purpose of this, there isn't a firm consensus. Some think that the fibers would have served a decorative purpose hanging down from the instrument, while others think they might have been used to move the sliding mechanism that was out of reach by pulling the, the thread. So as Suzanne began to re-adhere more fragments, some startling identifications were made thanks to in-situ photography. Suzanne created this image which shows a convincing match of the fragments in their current state to the excavation photo. 
As the fragments became longer with more joins, we needed a better storage solution. Thus, we created this channeled row configuration out of archival ethafoam, which allowed longer joins to be made. I should mention that we are not re-adhering re every fragment. So this arrangement allows us to show potential matches that are either not stable enough to mend due to material loss, but also allows us to try out various configurations. In 2015, we invited ancient alloy specialist Stefan Hagel from the Austrian Academy of Arts and Sciences, Olga Sukowska from the European Music Archaeology Project, EMAP, along with instrument maker and um, engineer from Middlesex University, Peter Holmes, to come and examine the fragments. You see us in the, the ancient world library looking at all of the boxes and bit of the bits. Stefan created schematics which plotted different ancient modes or scales and where the associated tone holes would be. By first lying out the longer like fragments, ones with similar measurements and materials, side by side, he started to be able to see musical connections. So this is a map of one of his schematics showing the different placement of where tone holes should be. And because of this kind of schematic, he was able to also identify where um, certain mechanisms would have been placed due to the ergonomics of playing the instrument. He then took the data and modeled the scales using software, a software program he designed. His schematics showed approximate location of the holes in relation to the ancient modalities. This allowed him to associate fragments with missing joins and arrangements that made musical sense, especially in fragments in which there weren't any very clear um, joins that could be made. He was able to estimate what fragments would fit where. Using this technology, he was able to better determine the match pairs of the instruments since they would be in the same mode and would be roughly the same size. So this is what we came to. Stefan, Suzanne, Olga, and Peter were able to find like pairs and rest them in what we think are their proper orientation. The long pipes at the bottom are the longest ever found, and we have determined that the dolphin sliders would have fit on them, allowing sound holes to, out of reach to be covered and uncovered. So now I'd like to play a brief video. Not able to get to the screen, sorry. Yeah. So these are instruments that were 3D printed that are very like our fragments.
So given all of the information that we've gleaned and now having a basic type of replica made, we hope that Peter Holmes and Stefan Hagel will be able to create replicas of our instruments using the um, traditional materials. So here's a photo of um, what one type of instrument might look like using traditional materials. Um, as I come to the end of my presentation, I would like to highlight how wonderful the cross-departmental collaboration was for us. I think that all departments, this was a very unique project for the MFA, and I don't think to this date so many departments have been involved in a single project, but to have everyone come together and really help us learn more about one of the most important instruments in our collection um, was really amazing. Um, and it really helped to have perspectives in art history, conservation, science, and music. Um, so we hope to tell this story in a small exhibition or um, some sort of digital exhibition um, in the coming years. And with that, I'd just like to say that um, we continue to update our conservation project page. Um, so continue to follow our project there. And I look forward to answering any questions at the end. Thank you. And our third presentation, Jean-Philippe Huchard, who I know had significant problems and challenges trying to shrink 15 plus years of research into this. Thank you, very much Thank, you, Fran. Thank you, Fran, for the introduction. Thank you, Caroline and Lynn, for the invitation to this top series lecture. And uh, thank you to the Library of Congress. We I'm from France, uh, so pardon my English if it's not uh, totally perfect. Um, I work in the Cité de la Musique Philharmonie de Paris, which is a um, insti public institution dedicated to music in France, in Paris, in the Northeast 19th arrondissement. This um, institution has three main feet, if I may say, dedicated to concerts, dedicated to education in music, to a wide range of audiences, kids, to adults, and also heritage about music. It's located very close to the Conservatoire de Paris, which has been founded in the, during the French Revolution. I show here one of, the, uh, one of the concert halls. It's the largest concert halls we have in the institution, in the Philharmonie. It's La Salle Pierre Boulez. And uh, we have also two other smaller uh, concert halls. Here are a few views of the gallery of the Musée de la Musique. So we exhibit instruments, but also fine arts, collection, paintings, sculptures, uh, dedicated to music and presenting music. So it's not only a collection of musical instruments, but also of artworks dedicated to music. We have uh, approximately 1,000 pieces on view and for a total of 7,000, roughly speaking, accession numbers in the collection. It is the French national collection of musical instruments and music-related artworks. And uh, so it's quite unique, at least in France. It's a collection, I mean, for musical instruments, it's a collection that is owned by the French nation, the French people. It's, it was created around the French Revolution. These are the origin of the collection and it has been growing since. Today, we are, I show here a few numbers. Um, we, one thing I could point out is we are playing instruments of the collection that are played only in the building. We have a dedicated auditorium, which you will see at the end of my talk, uh, 250 seats approximately, dedicated to chamber music, for instance. And we play instruments of the collection there in a programming which is part of the large program of concerts of the whole Philharmonie. So it's 
roughly speaking, 15 concerts a year, plus every two Sunday in the afternoon, if you buy your museum ticket and you come visit the museum, there are what is called the concert promenade, with a more informal way of presenting music, concerts, uh, in the galleries of the museum. We also receive specific visitors, which are scholars, or musicologists, or musicians, or instruments makers. And they come to the lab, conservation lab, and they, pr they are studying in depth this instrument or that instrument to make a copy, to get inspiration of, or to study acad for academic research. Um, which you see here, a group of uh, a school from a violin making school in Germany. We, um, in the staff of the Musée de la Musique, there is a group, a um, small department, uh, dedicated to research. So we have a conservation lab, research and conservation lab. And we are, we are also four curators and an assistant. And part of our work is to uh, perform research. And so our research activities are dedicated to several fields. And sometimes they interconnect. So this is music history in general, but mostly the history of the makers, the musicians and the collectors related to their musical instruments, the history of techniques of musical instrument making as part also of the cultural history. So we study, of course, the materials and the technique of elaboration of the instruments, but also in their technical cultural context. And sometimes it leads to economics studies or such kind of studies, which seems kind of far related to uh, the music instrument making itself. We um, also study in some cases the way the musical instrument works, how it sounds. So these are more the fields of physics and acoustics in particular. We um, study also conservation and I like the treatments that should be specifically developed for instruments, play especially when instruments are kept in playing conditions. And finally, we think and we work on the heritage values of the ob musical instruments, which are part of our cultural heritage. It is different to keep and to preserve musical instruments in a national collection, like we do, than to conserve instruments in your own private collection when you are a musician and collecting instruments. So it's, these are not the same things. And um, uh, values that the society or the owner of the instrument attach or sees in the object is not the same, and we try to consider this aspect as also. Oh, I forgot to mention, sorry that um, we are, uh, as a team, part of a larger, of larger consor consortiums. Uh, we are part of the CRC, which is a um, French public research lab of the CNRS agency. And uh, CRC is a very important uh, laboratory to for the study of materials, but also conservation, conservation in general. And they are, uh, we are part also of a several consortium which allows collaborative research in terms of history of music, history, but also other experimental sciences. And we, you see the, the logos here. So now uh, we can go a little more in depth and fo focus on uh, the Stradivari violins in the Paris collection. I'm now the curator in charge of both string instruments, so these five violins are, uh, I'm in charge of, among other instruments. And uh, these are very, this is a, a nice group. You have a nice group of Stradivari <laughs> instruments here as well. Um, I'm not, uh, and it's good these instruments are in public collections. Um, they have been uh, given by Bequest mostly to the Paris Conservatoire Museum in the late 19th century and in the early 20th century. We count, we are lucky to count five instruments that enter, so before 1935 in the Paris collection. We count also other items by 
this workshop by Antonio Stradivari. And these are one, uh, one guitar, one of the six or seven remaining guitars named the Vuillaume. Uh, we have also a pochette, a very narrow violin named the Clapisson. And um, we have also uh, six molds for cellis and smaller instruments coming from the workshop and various fingerboards and pieces of instruments, so baroque, baroque like original fingerboards and uh, such tiny instruments with which are very important for the research and the original state of these instruments. So among these five Stradivari violins, I will um, go more into detail to talk about the Davidoff, which is, which is uh, from the year 1708. Before that, um, I am, I, like Francis say, said earlier, uh, I, there, are, there were various researches on the violins at the Musée de la Musique. So namely researches on varnishes, and it was actually my PhD a few years ago, and uh, for also the identification of techniques and ingredients that were used to varnish Stradivari violins, but also in the technical context of European varnishing of musical instruments. So I studied with a team, I studied lutes from the 17th century, their varnish, uh, other violins from other centers of making in Europe, and to compare all this in a quite series approach or corp corpus-oriented approach. Since uh, 2010 and the end of my PhD, I research went on uh, again, and I would like to mention the, the work of Sophie Tira, who was my PhD student later, and she worked on a specific, very specific work, which is of interest, especially to violin makers nowadays who prepare their own varnish according to historical recipes. We studied the parameters of like the oil to resin ratio, because it's in the chemical analysis I had performed, you couldn't see, uh, detect properly the ratio of the ingredients. So she worked on that, studying this parameter and also the cooking time and the cooking duration to prepare the varnish and how it would connect to the coating properties, layering properties, color properties, etc. And she was allowed, uh, she was uh, able to present like a range of parameters which in which it's possible to make a good working varnish with only two ingredients, which is drying oil and pine resins. Other, there are other uh, topics than varnish when we speak about violins. And uh, I may mention ongoing works in the past few years. Uh, two works are uh, on woods, so identification of woods and dating of woods and we have been recently working namely on the purfling woods, which are uh, tiny bits of wood in the board and in the back of the instruments to try to identify the wood species. And it's not that easy when you know the typical scale of a uh, wood structure compared to the width, very narrow width of the strips of the purfling. Another aspect, which is not experimental science, but more history research, is the research on provenance. And I'm mentioning here two works. We have been lucky in 1909 to receive the bequeath of the Provigny 1716 Stradivarius among six instruments and eight bows coming from the Provigny family. And I've been working on this bequeath to, on this group of instruments to find the provenance and to discover previous owner and we were able to go back to the early 19th century for this group of instruments which is not the total history of the instruments but still it's a good step learning going back in the past. I'm also mentioning an upcoming monograph on the Sarasati violin so it's a 1724 uh, Strad which uh, was bequested by Pablo de Sarasat to the museum in 1909 again. And a, 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 a little book monograph will be published and available for the moment in French only, but I'm sure you will uh, read French on, on this violin. So 
now the 1708 Davidov violin. This instrument is, from a conservation state point of view, in a very good general conditions. There were no open cracks, no warm woodworm galleries that were inside, so we performed in situ um, imaging techniques as, such as X-ray radiograph and other examination to check this and it was in very good general condition. We were then able to consider to bring it back to playing condition because this instrument had not played for at least 30 to 40 years in the collection. It has been kept either in storage or behind the glass case only. And we were considering to, if there, if there was a possibility to play at least uh, one of these five violins, and the Davidov seemed the most suited for this. 1708, it's considered to be in the most esteemed period of Stradivari instrument. Some of them, some people named this period the golden period, but whatever uh, it means, it was a representative object with all the main part original. So the whole sound box, as well as the score coming from Antonio Stradivari work. And it was still a challenge to bring it back to playing condition. It has not been played for 30 to 40 years. We do not have a um, restoration, um, a violin restorer in the staff, would, which would do the work. So we would have to contract the work to a private conservator. So the challenge was to bring the workshop of the conservator inside our science lab. And it was already some, uh, there was some thought, thoughts given to that. And also, what should we do? What, what should we give the people to hear and to see during this process? And it was the, the general approach. And we, it took some time to, to, do, thi to do this. And I'm going to lead you to this little journey, and which will go to, to the use of science objects as well. So the, a few words on the provenance of the Davidov. Uh, so Davidov is not Karl Davidov, the cellist, who, and one of the cello of Stradivari is named the Davidov after Karl Davidov. Davidov was and is a common uh, name in Russia. And this Davidov uh, is uh, Vladimir Alexandrovich Davidov and is not apparently related, not parent, to the Karl Davidov, the cellist. It's another one. And I'm pointing this because in books that are gathering the history of many strads, you often find the confusion between the two, in especially for our 1708 violin. Vladimir Alexandrovich Davidov, uh, his mother was French. She escaped when she was two uh, from Versailles during the French Revolution. And this woman, she eventually married a general of the Russian army when she was uh, older. And Vladimir Alexandrovich Davidov was their son, but he was still very attached to France. And in the end of th at the end of his life, he was being a diplomat or, or a speci special consular for the Tsar. And he was often to France for political reasons or diplomatic reasons. And we know that at least in 1880, he was already owning this violin because uh, the famous violin expert and dealer named Charles Eugène Gant, who was very active in, in Paris in 1880, saw this instrument and described it at the back of one of his own business card. So you see the, the, the photograph of the back of the business card of Charles Gengan, and this is now conserved in the Archives Nationales in, in France, where he described even the state of conservation. There is a little bit of a soundboard post patch, etc. very uh, beau vernis rouge clair bien conservé, so nice looking red varnish, bright red varnish, well preserved, etc. And um, so one year before his death, uh, Davidov went to see the head of the conservatoire at the time in Paris and told him, I will give you by bequest uh, my, my strad. And he died, he passed away one year after. And in 1887, the, mu the Musée of the Conservatoire re received for the first time 
uh, one Stradivari violin. So it was a big thing in France, it was in the newspapers, etc. And uh, the condition of the, uh, of the bequeathed was this instrument shall be played by the first violin prize each year, you know, at the conservatoire, the person awarded the first prize violin could play this Strad for uh, the concert after the graduation ceremony. Is it, is it clear? I mean, yeah. um, and uh, the first uh, one who played it in 1887 was Fritz Kreisler, and he was 12 or 13 at the time. And uh, so Fritz Kreisler played it one night only for a very tiny piece. Um, so this is anecdotal, but I wanted to share that. The violin was uh, later exhibited for the 200th anniversary of the death of Stradivari at the exhibition in Cremona in 1937. And um, after it was lent to several students uh, for international competition, and uh, including Beata, Ska, Beata Alska in 81, and apparently, according to the records, it was the last loan to, to a young musician. And after that, the instrument was not exactly maintained in playing condition, and it was just briefly played and tried by Régis Pasquier, who is one of the Paris Conservatoire violin teacher, and also a musician, obviously, very briefly in 2004 and 2007. But the setup of the instrument was not perfect. The fingerboard was not flat, I mean, uh, properly adjusted, the bridge as well as had some issue, etc. So there were issues in the setup at least. So we thought uh, if we were to play it again, we should play it in a good setup state for musicians to be comfortable with, but still according to the deontology of the Sim Sim and the non-invasiveness non on original parts, etc. So we were to consider the heritage values associated not only to the violin in general, but to each of its parts. So even the fingerboard, if you think of that, the fingerboard dated circa the 60s, 1960s, the current fingerboard on the violin. And it was a work of Etienne Vatelot, who was uh, a preeminent, maybe the, the best known or the most famous uh, violin maker and expert in the 20th century. So it's also part of the heritage. And should we keep it, not keep it? Um, so we decided to make 3D laser scans, uh, measurements of the original, of the before restoration state, before removing these parts, the setup of Vatlo, and keep it aside. So now it's kept in the storage room, the 1960s setup and put a new one because the previous one was not able to play. Um, this illustrates the fact that a violin is a composite, composite object uh, which, which has evolved in the centuries. So it's not, even if it's, this violin dates 1708 on the label, even if its original parts are all from 1708 coming from Stradivari, still the setup or the sound post or the pegs or the tailpiece are not original, but they are still part of the material history of the object. And these were the main concerns we had in the restoration process. Uh, so documentation of the state before restoration, before treatment was very important. Also, we wanted to improve the visual aspect of the instrument because the instrument was really dirty and we will go on that the appearance was not very proper for the good, correct lisibility of the wood, of the varnishes, etc., especially on the soundboard. S we decided in the course of this treatment to uh, try to use uh, scientific imaging technique or measurement techniques to follow the process of the restoration, so to properly document the initial state before restoration and document the evolution of the instrument during the treatment. So this will be the focus of my talk uh, now. I'll give you here a few images of some aspects of the treatment and the restoration process. Um, I want to mention the very good collaboration we have had with the violin 
conservator who is named Balthazar Soulier and he has this workshop uh, named Atelier Cells in Paris. He is the one who did the, the conservation work. And you see parts of him, these are his hands, hands in gloves. You see here he's uh, regluing uh, a little crack uh, on the soundboard. And um, so a few views of uh, some aspects of the work. Here we are on the scroll, and you may see that um, the original, these are the original holes for the pegs, so they have not been on this one uh, bushed and redrilled, which is frequently the case. So we are lucky to have these uh, original holes for the peg holes. So they were uh, reinforced by uh, spiral bushings here. So it's during the, the operation afterwards, ob obviously it has been finished properly. You see the finished state in the middle under UV. And uh, Balthazar also treated a, a little crack here on this side, which was worrisome uh, if we were to think about the playing condition and the regular tuning of the instrument. And it was uh, very finely filled with a piece of, adjusted piece of wood, and um, it's really fine now. Uh, in his um, expert look at the surfaces of the instrument, led Balthazar to, uh, to present uh, a kind of a map of the various layers of materials that were on the soundboard. And so everything is, uh, we have for reference a UV light image, which is, which is very frequent to document the, the surface state of, of varnished uh, instrument. And we were really wor worried about this uh, layer in this area very heavy, very rigid uh, material, um, a little bit like concrete, a very thin layer of mineral-like uh, material, and uh, a not very adequate red-black patina, uh, which had some original varnish under. Uh, so these were the main uh, layers or non-original material we decided to to remove or to uh, make it lighter in order to improve the uh, readib readability of uh, the underneath surface. So you see in the, it, these are two pictures. There on the, on the left, it's the original state before any treatment, and this is during the treatment. Um, it's, uh, the treatment is not finished, so it's not, it's now it's better, it's more homogeneous even. It's during the treatment, but a lot of the patina and the dirt, especially on the side of the fingerboard area and in this uh, central part of the soundboard were very carefully um, partially removed or almost totally removed. To, to, to track maybe more objectively the, the changes that occurred, we, we used um, uh, a system, a multispectral imaging system that we've made, built in our in our lab, and it's um, it's a way to collect the light re-emitted, reflected by the violin, uh, using um, a system which is better than a simple red, green, blue camera with three three channels. We used a fourteen channel color camera, if you want to say, and uh, this allows. So you see here this, the 14 band pass of the 14 filters, and we collect a series, a stack of 14 images, each of them corresponding to a very narrow band in the visible regions uh, of the uh, spectrum. And this process allows to measure the reflected light properly emit, uh, emitted, reflected by, by the object. It's not exactly a color measurement. It's a measurement of the reflectance. It's related, but it's not the same. And uh, we did some comparison in one of the band. So we, we picked this band in the yellow area, in the ye yellow area of the visible spectrum, just to show it to you. But we could have picked the other bands, like 
uh, in the spectral region. The idea is, was to subtract the, uh, to make a subtraction like between what is now the instrument looking like minus what was the instrument looking like before using this uh, multispectral reflectance imaging. And it allows, so there is a, a false color, so there is a quite heavy, for, for me at least, my colleagues are very expert on that, uh, uh, data processing, data correction, so that you can subtract. And you see the false color, the pink area, shows to you where the, there is more reflected light emitted after treatment than before treatment in the yellow region. And it's a way to pr very properly document and map where material has been removed, where color, <laughs> sorry, I said color, and it's color scientists will not be happy if I say that, um, where uh, more light is reflected from the instrument in the yellow region. So basically where it was very dark, now it's brighter in the yellow. I'm showing only the yellow, but we can do that for all the spectrum. And you see, there was obviously a, a, a gain in brightness in the central region, but also, I don't know if you see that on the, on the screen, but this uh, little badly restored in the past, maybe in the 19th century crack, was a colored retouch that was not well and we make it lighter so now it's a brighter area and dirt in in this area has been cleaned and here in this corner it has been cleaned as well so it's very precise each pixel corresponds to uh, an area smaller than one millimeter on the object so it's quite finely resolved another tool we use is more for geometry the variations in geometry of the sound box and of the instrument during the process. So, um, so this is not a CT scan, which is using X-rays. It is a laser scan. So it gets you, you obtain only the outer surface of the object and not the inside. But still, it's a, an arm that you can bring to the museum and you don't have to move the instrument to the CT scan. So it's very, uh, easy and it has a very good uh, resolution and you get directly on the computer while you acquire you, you swipe uh, the laser line on the object and you collect a 3d surface then like in the multispectral imaging you can make subtraction like before and after comparison so this image is a subtraction image of what is the difference between when you ha when the sound post is in position and when the sound post is not in position because at some point we removed the old sound post in the instrument and you see that when you uh, remove uh, sorry when you place the sound post the the area of the soundboard is getting higher obviously it's kind of obvious for violin makers who are here but there are um, movements uh, of the soundboard. And you see this, usually the sound post is here, touching here, the sound board, but the consequences on the evolution of the height also come up to here. You see it's bluer here. And it means that the whole structure is moving in a complex way. So in the idea of the risk assessment we take when we make a modification of the instrument, when we set up even a sound post, this kind of tools could be very useful. On a, at a larger, larger scale, when we make this subtraction um, uh, after treatment minus before treatment, we see a general modification of the violins where when you string the, when you tune the instrument, when it's strung, obviously the soundboards go lower, lower because of the pressure of the bridge. And it's, uh, what is the scale? It's about one millimeter lower the deflection of this area, which is not, it's a lot when you think that the soundboard is two and a half millimeter thick, you know. And um, interestingly also we see that com relatively in terms of relative position, the scroll, I mean the, the head is going up 
when you pull the strings. And um, it, this kind of modifications help also, and it gives you a range of the scale, the magnitude of these changes. And uh, it's like the move relative mov movement of the scroll is one millimeter also, approximately, in the other direction. So the soundboard is going one millimeter down, roughly speaking, and the, the scroll is going one millimeter up. So if you want to treat, and, and we are planning to use this kind of 3D metrological tools to follow, uh, to monitor instruments that are kept in playing condition. It might be a way to um, follow and to detect early enough if the structure is moving too much, is changing too much. Third, I'm showing you an, another technique, quite experimental, that has been developed by our colleagues in Institut Jean Leron d'Alembert, which is in, uh, in Paris University. Um, and this tool is part of the acoustics field and the vibrations field. You imagine, uh, you see on the top, a side view of an array of microphones, these are 128 microphones in an array, in a grid matrix, and uh, they record sound all at the same time. They are synchronized, so you collect on 128 channels simultaneously the acoustic answer at the microphone. So we don't play the violin here, we will not bow uh, on the instrument. It's a tool to again look at the way the soundboard vibrates and how the instrument vibrates. The experiment, you need to make a little impact with a uh, triggered by computer, a hammer triggered by computer. So you, you know where, when it's triggered and you synchronize the sound collection of the 128 microscope. And this is giving you what is called the near field acoustical holography. So it's giving you data of this, the air pressure modification at the mics, but it tells you how the soundboard vibrates. And if there is a crack in the soundboard, you will see in the answer of the machine, of the technique. So this is a very important uh, mechanical monitoring tool. And here I'm showing the uh, radiated pressure, sound pressure. It's an average on the 128 microphones. And the x-axis is the frequency in hertz. And you have modes of vibration of the soundboard, which are appearing as peaks in the uh, spectrum. I'm not a specialist of this field. It's my colleague Sandy Lecomte and our colleagues as at Institut Jean Leron d'Alembert who are the experts on that. Um, but uh, we evidence quite important and noticeable differences in the vibration modes between the before the treatment and after the treatment. So this is currently uh, investigated to attribute properly the changes to this operation in the treatment or that operation in the treatment. It could be the uh, regluing of uh, the strengthening of the gluing of the soundboard in one part on the ribs. It could be something else. It could be the sound post, post position, etc. It's under investigation, but I wanted to share that tool with you, which is totally non-invasive. The, the hammer is very, uh, very light, a tiny hammer, and uh, just to allow the sound box to vibrate. So um, we come towards the end of my talk. I hope I'm not too, too long. And uh, these three techniques use, uh, use light, the reflectance in the visible spectrum, use a laser to measure geometrical mod modification, and use vibration in air, so sound, sound waves, to um, analyze and to monitor without contact the changes on one instrument. And it's, to us, we are uh, quite satisfied by these tools. We have been experimenting during this conservation pro process, and we hope to uh, improve and go on with the use of this non-invasive tool, I repeat, 
to, to follow the, the treatment. So hopefully, finally, the, the instrument has been uh, restrained and is in playing condition. So what, sh what should we do with, uh, with that? Uh, I need to try to show this to you. Um, So this is a recording that has been performed by David Grimal uh, in the auditorium of the Musée de la Musique. This uh, instrument is now in playing condition. We are very happy with that. The visitors and the aud uh, audience uh, is very pleased with that. And now we hope and we are currently thinking of further programs with this instrument. And it can be CDs, uh, re CD recordings performed at the Musée de la Musique and also concert pro concerts programming in the same uh, venue, same hall. So we are now considering uh, which project will occur after this uh, short video you may find on the YouTube channel of the Philharmonie uh, de Paris. I, am, um, I would like to, to, to thank um, a lot of colleagues, uh, the colleagues in, in uh, the science, in the research uh, team of the Musée de la Musique, so Sandy Lecomte, Stéphane Weidlich is the head of the uh, lab, and also for the video production Delphine de la Bille at the Musée de la Musique. And outside of the team of the Musée de la Musique, but it's showing the interdisciplinary collaborations we have with uh, other scientists. Uh, Ber Balthazar Soulia mentioned who was the conservator on this violin. Uh, Camille Simonchan, who did, uh, the, who performed the reflectance multispectral imaging with me and who treated the data uh, on multispectral imaging with Henri Boutin. Sylvie Lemoyne and uh, François Olivier for the near field acoustical holography. Florian Mo Moreno uh, from the company Art, Graphic and Patrimoine for the 3D laser scans. And Christian Binet for the wood purfling analysis. And I uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. So we will now take uh, questions from the audience for any of the speakers. We have uh, around 50 people online um, listening in, so we will ask, I will try and interpret the question and we'll repeat that so that our off-site audience can hear the question and answer. And uh, we will also check to see if there's any questions from outside as well. So the floor belongs to you all. I open up. Although I must admit it's hard to think after that, that last video. Can I ask another question for the colleagues? So, um, was there any documentation? You have very well described how you document what you did from the moment you started to your preservation and restoration of the instrument. Is there a lot of So the question was, was the documentation prior to the 
treatment and conservation work that helps understand more about what had happened to the instrument? Um, we have no record archives of previous treatments on the instruments. Um, especially the only documents, the, the only document is the instrument itself. Um, so unfortunately, no document was kept for the modifications. In some other instances, we, uh, since we keep also archives in our collection from the uh, workshop founded by Lupo, a very important workshop in the 19th century in Paris, we can find we can find such records. But in the case of the Davidoff known, um, on the mentioning the, the scroll, the head and peg box, we have been able to evidence that uh, there are entures, um, I don't know in, fr in English, but the neck uh, has been changed th three times. You know, the neck is usually not original on, on violins of this period. And we have seen two different traces of changing neck work in the, when you s look at the peg box from the front. So this is um, an indication of the things that happen, uh, of the material history, of the works of previous repairer or restorer of the instrument. But for, um, so the second half of your question was, did we bring back the instrument to the original state, if I'm not yeah. wrong? I read on the card it mm. says that a moment this instrument says the scroll. It says mm. Lang and Ah, oui. Uh, merci. Um, in 1880, Gant reports that there is um, a repair in, in the sound post area. So it's a way to, di to date such a repair. So since Gant saw it, this repair was there before 1880. This, this kind of relative dating we have to deal with a lot because it's very, or it's very rare we have uh, archives records of old treatments. So the question was the interpretation of the acoustical analysis. Uh, thank you. Um, th this tool is using sound waves, the sound, uh, and records. So sound is a variation of pressure of air at the microphone or at the ear. And um, it uses acoustic or sounds. But the aim of it is not to record the sound or to tune, to adjust the sound. It is to, s to monitor or record the mechanical behavior. So the, the way the, the plate vibrates and its vibrating modes. So it's mostly vibration, if I'm correct. I, I'm not the expert I told you in this uh, sp field. So the idea uh, is to see the changes in the mechanical structure of the instrument. And it has certainly effects on the sound, the mechanical structure, how it vibrates. But it's uh, not very uh, related in a, an obvious manner. I, I'm, we cannot tell from these spectral measurements how it affects the sound. It's more complex than this. The, I have to say that the violin has a vibrating structure is a very complex stru structure to model properly. And uh, every violin is slightly different. Uh, even modern violins are slightly different. And it's very difficult to model properly I the influence of each of the parameter, especially when we go to the sound. Mm -hmm. Well, so you use the acoustical information to sort of help select the instrument. 
um, we, for the moment, we, we use it to monitor the changes only. We, we didn't go far enough um, until now to it would need a, a dedicated long-term, like a one-year study or a postdoc or something like that, to, to study exactly uh, the effect of this parameter, let's say the sound post position and length on the changes of the structure. It would need that to understand exactly what we do. And I showed you only an over an, a simple spectrum, if I may say, which is an average spectrum of related to the vibration of the instrument, but we would be also available, uh, it would be also possible to make maps so you would see the vibration modes uh, on how the plates uh, deform and vibrate at certain frequency, which would help also, but this is some extra work, a lot of computer time and, um, and treatment. The question was what process was used to remove the existing patina? Um, a dedicated mixture of solvents of uh, three types, which, were, uh, which are widely used in painting conservation and furniture conservation. And the, I will not go into the theoretical aspect of this, but it's a field like the effect, um, the ways to use solvent to clean surfaces is uh, widely inspired from decades, if not one century of solvent studies to clean paintings. So in this case, uh, I will not say, I mean, I don't have in mind exactly the three solvents that were um, mixed in various ratios to adapt to the reactivity of the surface we want, the material we wanted to remove. But uh, this was done with this solvent, which were in contact on very small areas using a uh, swab, swab, cotton swab uh, with this solvent, or uh, a tiny droplets using a micro syringe to, to bring the solvent and the contact time of the solvent was controlled as well. And then the material removed and uh, all this was done under the binocular microscope uh, to, to, to control at best with visual the thing in some tiny areas where the materials would be um, not responding perfectly to the solvent mixture we would use a mechanical abrasion with a micro scalpel as well under binocular control how do you call that? The, a stereo microscope is the proper one. I'm sorry about that. The question was about the storage uh, recommendations going forward. Uh, Carolyn, perhaps? I know this is um, close conservation. Right. Uh, we worked with the conservation um, uh, part of under the Preservation Directorate, and we um, have created a modified cabinet, a storage cabinet that's gasketed, um, and it has a glass front so I can look in. Um, and just eyeball things and not pull out the drawer. Um, and it's um, the drawers inside are perforated to allow for airflow. There are two fans in there that also help circulate the air. Then the flutes themselves, so that's the cabinet, but within each flute, we had um, special uh, cases made for boxes, made for each individual flute. Um, that has like a micro um, f um, filament, uh, like a cloth that sort of suspends the flute and the ends of the box are exposed or open um, to allow as much air circulation as we can. And then 
um, there is silica gel um, at the bottom also um, at, a, at a controlled set point or a relative set point that we have. So we actually have um, started that. We tested it for quite a few months and we've put the flutes in this cabinet and we continue to monitor one, one of our monitor people back there. Ben is, is here and um, it's been fantastic to work with them to study the temperature and humidity that we're keeping in there. It's well known that when you have glass that's unstable, it's very important to keep, to um, put things in an environment that's very steady so it's not cycling anymore. And if you have hydrated glass, it's quite dangerous to lower the humidity too much. So I, I don't remember the recommended relative humidity you have uh, uh, that you're maintaining now. But I do know, you know, it, it's just kind of a warning because metals are kept relatively dry to, uh, so that they don't corrode. But the, if the glass is already hydrated, it, it could actually could be in an equilibrium where the water is actually holding together a certain amount and could just literally fall apart. So it would be quite dangerous to dry out uh, glass. And we did look at historical uh, records of the relative humidity and temperature in the previous vault setting. And uh, we did see a certain amount of cycling, especially that was seasonal. So we've gone to great effort to um, eliminate that kind of variation in the uh, atmosphere. Um, even just opening the drawers and taking them from the drawer into the room for a, a researcher caused a spike. So uh, we, we went to great lengths to eliminate that. The question was whether there's a characteristic fluorescence for potash flutes. Yeah, um, I think uh, the literature is a little bit confusing about uh, fluorescence of glass, and a lot of people felt that it was just unpredictable. Um, but uh, we are fortunate that Laurent always put that little dash of manganese in, uh, and because of that manganese, uh, we can tell that it, it does have a characteristic fluorescence, which was that yellowy green color that Stephanie showed. And in fact, it's very important in UV examination to use two wavelengths. So you can use long and short UV. And the fluorescence is a little bit different. And we are now batting 100% in predicting whether we have a high leaded glass or a potash glass for Laurent's flutes, because remember, they're a formulation. So it's not just potassium and silicon. There's a lot of other things. Or it's not just lead and silicon. And uh, yes, it's, it's very characteristically um, that yellowy green color. Uh, and the leaded ones are also known in short wave to be this, what people call icy blue. Um, and the combination of that pink and the icy blue in the two wavelengths is very definitive for those high leaded glasses. So uh, as I said, we've been using this technique and we're literally 100% spot on in predicting which type of uh, glass it is. So I think we'll just wrap up the questions for now and you can catch some of the speakers afterwards. I think you'll join me in saying that was a, a fantastic uh, group of presentations and I love the fact that we saw so much influence and importance placed on the collaboration and the multidisciplinary approach and just the need because we all have slightly different expertises and we all need to work together and pull those um, the fact that we're all doing sometimes similar techniques sometimes different and new applications of those focusing on the non-invasive and also the educational component um, and the dissemination of research because if we're going to use or protect our cultural heritage then we need to make sure that we're sharing this information. So I just want to mention that the next TOPS presentation uh, is Preservation Week on April 23rd. Um, there'll be a number of events, including a lunchtime lecture, and this is all on the website, uh, but also there will be preservation tours, so have a look at the website. But once again, please, uh, this will bring to an end this part of the, the afternoon, and please join me in thanking all of our speakers.
very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.